welcome everybody in the service this morning. It's good to see each and every one of you, including our visitors. Um, got a few prayer requests this morning, and then uh, we will do uh, some <coughs> honoring of the veterans. And we got a video, and then we'll do the offering. Okay, um, Brother Randall's uncle, Fred Pickett, is has uh, prostate cancer, right? So just remember him. Uh, Sister Sandy Dean, she's feeling a little bit better. She's even home, but she still is asking for prayer, so continue to remember her. Uh, Kevin Byers, uh, remember him? He's feeling under the weather. Uh, Billy told me that his uh, blood oxygen level dropped to 70%. So um, please remember him in your prayers. Remember my father-in-law, Frankie. He's uh, having trouble with his back. And then uh, Sister Maurice uh, had talked to Sister Betty Clark. And uh, she's asking for prayers for her and for her family. So just continue to remember all of them. With that being said, does anybody have any unspoken request or would like to speak of any requests? Okay. Let's go to God and uh, let's just remember all these requests. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, praising you for such a beautiful still out there and okay well, I'm not used to him being up here but uh, uh, brother Joe's out there so let's just uh, appreciate these gentlemen to see the things that they have gone through the time away from their family and their sacrifice Amen. has led to our freedom. Amen. Amen. But we know that we have ultimate freedom in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. So, thank, thank you. you.
to the families of the ones that did not make it back. We thank you too. Thank you, veterans. All right, we'll go ahead and do our ties now.
I just missed it somewhere. And uh, when, when I went down and come back up, the song that was in my heart was Until Then. And the doctor come up and he said, you know, you was right and I was wrong. He said there was no cancer. They just had to take out six Thank inches you. of the coal. Thank you, and that was in 1995. And I'm here. I'm 92 years old now. <laughs> Before the doctor went down, he came in and told me I had cancer. I said, uh-uh, doc, I don't accept. <laughs> I want to take just a moment to praise the Lord as well. I had an appointment with a surgeon at uh, Wake Forest Baptist Thursday in Winston-Salem. They, all the doctors have been talking about various treatments and surgery, and I was going to have to do something uh, for the prostate cancer, but uh, this surgeon said, I've studied your case thoroughly, and he said, I see no reason to disrupt everything. He said, we're not going to do Praise the Lord. I was able to get here in time for choir practice first tonight. <laughs> and I come here praising, praising the Lord. And I have been praising him ever since. So back when I was in the hospital in July, uh, three different times with sepsis infection because of the biopsy, I uh, had a song on my mind, but I did not know the name of it, didn't know who sang it, but I was determined I was going to learn it. So it's uh, praise his name. Amen. I'm ready with the bail. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat>
Let somebody give God praise. I mean, yes, Lord, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I just heard how worthy he is. I heard some testimonies here about the goodness of him and his healing power and all that he's done. Oh, you can't be. You can't be. That's just, that's just the way it is. Man, it's so good to see such a good-looking congregation this morning giving yourselves a praise. And you got up and come in. You said, well, what about that? Listen, let me, let me tell you something in case you haven't been told. It puts a smile on God's face when he sees yes. people come into his house to worship him. And I, and I know that's why you're here today. And it does. It does. He, he desires mercy, not sacrifice. We're going to talk about that. <coughs> It's good to see Sonny and her family here. So good you guys are able to be back. I mean, yeah, good job. Thanks, it's good. The past couple of years have been struggles for a lot of people. And just, just so good to see everybody back. Happy birthday, Matthew. You're an old man. I had to get that in. He catches me. He knows when my birthday is. And he starts a month ahead of time. And he, when he comes in the door, he says, you're going to be an old man. You're going to be an old man. So I finally got it back. Okay, you're catching me, big boy. So we love, we love that Matthew. Bless his heart. Lynn and I are so appreciative to all of you for all the appreciation shown us last week uh, on Pastor Appreciation Day. As I always say, you guys always appreciate us. It's not just a one-day event, but we thank you for, for, the, for all the gifts and the time you took and all the prayers and the thoughts and the cards and and we're, we're just glad to be, be a part of such a, such a loving church family. And that's what you guys are. You really are. And we're glad to be a part of that. And just want you to know that, that we're very humbled and, and very grateful by the show of appreciation. So thank you from, from the bottom of our hearts. Turn to the 51st Psalm this morning. This is a real, real familiar song to all of you. I know you've read it many times in devotion. And read it over again, and, and you hear a lot about it. But I think I think the mercies of God, and the forgiveness of God, and the righteousness of God, <laughs> and, and, the, and the degraded human nature. I think that's something we can never hear enough of because we can forget it. And and I know you're not guilty of it, but sometimes I take my salvation for granted. And I'm glad that you don't do that. I'm glad that you don't take it for granted. But it's easy, it's easy to do sometimes. So if you're able, I'm going to ask you to stand again. And if you're not able, don't worry about it. And I'm going to read this whole song. It's, it's all the way through 19 verses, but we need, we need to hear it. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, David wrote. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. He's the righteous judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. Say that with me. You desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. 
Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. And with burnt offering and a whole burnt offering, then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Amen. Father, I thank you today. I thank you for this time of worship we've enjoyed together already. This celebration of you in song and in prayer and in testimony and in giving. And now, Lord, we celebrate you in this word. So now, Father, as we look into these Holy Scriptures, which not only save our souls, but keeps our souls. I just pray now that you open up to us, not only in our minds, but in our hearts, those things you would have us to see, not only as a church, but as individuals, that we might be better disciples and better evangelists. And we'll give you the thanks and the praise, for it's all about you, Jesus. And in your name I ask it by faith. And all those who love him would say, we love you, Lord. Amen. 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 Greet someone next Amen. to you. Welcome our guests to the service. We have several guests who are with us today. We certainly appreciate you taking the time and, and coming to visit with us and pray for and sharing your worship experience with us. We thank you for that so much. The 51st Psalm. This psalm, was, this psalm, of course, was penned by King David after Nathan the prophet had come to him and revealed unto him that God knew about his affair with Bathsheba. David thought he had a kid. He thought that no one else in the kingdom knew but him and Bathsheba. He thought that after he had her husband killed, Uriah, he thought that would be the end of it, that it would be silence. And, and it was, for the most part, but it wasn't hidden from God. God saw exactly what the king had done. And it's, it's interesting to note the, the relationship that David had with God. It wasn't a fly-by-night relationship. David was appointed to his position by God. David was chosen by God to be on his throne upon the earth. And God had promised to David that you will always have a man or someone from your lineage on your throne. And of course he was speaking about Jesus Christ. But David didn't know that at that particular time. But what I see in King David and what I hear in the words of this psalm of repentance in this psalm of forgiveness is shame. I hear shame from David because David realized how good God was to him. And David knew from whom his strength had come. And the fact that David thought that because this sin had been hidden from everybody else in the world, that it had been hidden from God. And it was then that God sent Nathan the prophet to David and instead of confronting him face on and saying, God knows what you have done, he used reverse psychology. And he told David a story about a man who had this little lamb that was a pet. It was the family pet. And the man was poor. And he wasn't able to have all the things that King David had. And he wasn't as blessed as King David was. But he said he had this one little lamb and then this rich man came and took that family pet. He took that little lamb away and killed it so that he could feed his guests. And it blew David up. He got so mad at Nathan and he said, You tell me who it was and I will personally go kill him. And I will make sure that he's dead. And I imagine Nathan looked him in the eye and said, 
it's you, King David. You are that man. And I think at that moment it clicked in the mind of that warrior king and he realized God has not let you off the hook. Yes, the son that was born out of that adulterous affair had died. But David, you are not off the hook. I know what you have done and now you know that I know what you have done. And it was after that that David sat down somewhere, sometime, and put these words down in this psalm that I just read to you today. So let's just let's just look at a couple couple of pieces in this in this repentance, in this confession unto God, but it but it's filled with shame. There's no arrogance in these words. <coughs> There, there's not a lot of pride that comes out of David being a warrior and being the king of Israel, but he is shamed. He, he is brought down in the eyes of God as lower than a worm, as he wrote in one of his psalms. One of the psalms David wrote, he said, how can you be, how can you be so concerned with us when we're nothing but worms? That's the words he used in one of his psalms. But David understood the mercies and the justice and the righteousness of God. Sometimes we forget the fact that just because he is merciful and just because he is gracious and just because he is forgiving, that he overlooks sin. God will never overlook sin. Yes, he's merciful. Yes, he's gracious. Yes, he's understanding. <coughs> Yes, he is patient. Yes, he is slow to anger. But God hates sin. Amen. It makes no difference in who it is. He hates it regardless of the sin that's found. So in verses 1 and 2, David starts out pleading, pleading for forgiveness. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. It, it is by God's mercy that he didn't just strike David down at the moment he committed that sin. He had the right to, didn't he? Didn't he tell Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the moment you do what I tell you not to do, you will die. He told them that. He holds the right to do that. I preached a sermon on that one Sunday. And a gentleman was passing through from Washington, D.C. And after the service, he came into the office. And he said, I need to share something with you that I think you don't understand. I said, brother, I'm always open to learn. I'm always open to being taught about things I don't understand. He said, let me tell you something. God's not out to kill us. He's out to save us. And I said, yeah, but let me tell you something. God's not out to overlook sin, but he is going to judge it. Mm -hmm. He's going to judge it. Amen. And if you think for one minute that he don't have the sovereign right to kill you, then you don't understand who God is. Mm -hmm. When they put in these scriptures, we are to fear God. Yes, that's a holy fear. That's a reverent fear. But that's also a fear that says he can crush me like a bug oh, if yes. he so desires. David knew that. David knew his power. And he pleaded unto him, Oh God, have mercy on me based on your loving kindness. David knew it was nothing he deserved. David knew it was nothing that was owed to him. David could have very well said, Look, you have chosen me to be your servant and to be your vessel, and you're going to bless the nation through my seed, which would have been Christ that he had no idea about. But he could have prayed that up to God and said, look, you've got to keep me whether you want to or not because I am your man. Oh, can you imagine what God might have said to him? But David understood differently, Dave. He knew. He knew his position and he knew his place. And he knew the righteousness of God. The key to it is in verse 3 and 4. For I acknowledge 
by transgressions. Now that sounds good on the surface, and that sounds easy. I was reading an article about the Titanic a few weeks ago and about how close they come to missing that iceberg. They were within minutes of being able to steer around that thing. But as it came to pass, people on that ship had dropped the ball, and when they found out that, that the iceberg was in the way, they didn't have enough time to turn the ship. And when it nudged that iceberg and it hit the side of it, they thought that the only damage to that boat was what they could see above the water line because that's where the iceberg had hit. But what they did not see is that science says, and it is proven by icebergs, that 90% of it is under the water. There's more of the iceberg under the water than sticking out of the water. And the ship took the brunt of that which they could not see below the water line, and that's where the damage was that caused the Titanic to sink. It was the damage they had not seen that took them under. Dr. Billy Graham, the late Billy Graham said one time, there's no problem with a ship being in the ocean, but there's a problem if the ocean gets into the ship. And that is so true. And David, David knew that the sin that he had committed was within him, and he acknowledged it, but not until he was confronted. One would have thought that after the baby had died, that David would have went out on a hillside somewhere and covered himself in ashes and tore his robes, which is what they do when they grieve. He grieved before he died, but after he died, David got up, took a bath, cleaned up, put the oil on, that's shaving lotion in our day and time. Made himself smell good and went about his business thinking it was all over. But God knew it wasn't all <coughs> over. It looked good on the surface, but underneath he knew he was bad. He knew he was damaged. One would have thought he would have went out and prayed to God after the child died and said, oh, Lord, please forgive me for this sin. And this little baby has... Pay the price. Now, before you worry about that little baby, Jesus has got it. There's no problem with that. God knew the plan. He had it all lined out. But it's the fact that David didn't know the plan. But he didn't. Because he thought he had got, he had got by with it. Sometimes we don't acknowledge our sins until we're confronted with them. And when we're confronted with them, it makes us mad. Yeah. I, I think the politically correct word is offended. I see, we see that all the time. Oh, you got to be careful that you don't offend somebody. Well, you, you know, let's just put that you don't make them mad. Let's just put it in plain English. That's what we mean by offending them. We tell them something they don't want to hear. And if it's not true, then they don't get as mad as they do if it is true. Yeah, I, I mean, you know that to be a fact. The, the late B.E. Underwood, who I was ordained under, he said, guys, you are going to get criticized in your ministry. You are going to be criticized as ministers and as teachers and as pastors. You will be criticized. But listen to it, because some of it will be true. <laughs> and that's exactly the way it is. And when we're confronted with the truth, and it's pointed out to us, it's at that point sometimes we are forced to acknowledge it. But as long as we think it's hid, we're okay. In verse 6, David said, you, you want the truth in the inward parts. In the inward parts. See, that's the inner workings that you can't see. Always amazed. With, with the technology we have and the MRIs and the, and, and the ability to x-rays and sonar. I think old witness had every, every device that they make peeking in your body and knowing it's got to be working good or they would have 
they could have found a hat if they was wanted to do it. All they were looking at. So when you when that MRI comes and they and they look at that brain and it's sliced into 3D view and, and they're able to see all that going on. You know what they can't see? They can't see the thoughts. When you go in there, you have to tell them who you are. You think they would say, just lay down on the table, I'm going to put you in this machine and it'll tell me who you are. It don't work that way. It'll show you the tissue. It'll show you the blood. It'll show you the vessels. It'll show you that everything works. It don't see the thoughts. It don't know what you're thinking. It can't see that. But you're thinking... It don't see the real you, the soul that dwells inside this fleshly body. It can't bring that out. But guess who does? Guess who does see inside that heart? And he goes past the vessels. And he goes past the tissue. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says that the word of God is a double-edged sword dividing soul and spirit. It, it divides the flesh and blood and it even divides the soul and the spirit. All of us have a spirit. All of us have a soul. But all of us aren't saved. All of us aren't born again. All of us won't be able to go to heaven because of that very fact. We have never acknowledged the fact that we're sinners. We never acknowledge the fact that we need to be saved. Well, David acknowledged his sin because he said, You desire the truth which is in the inward parts. He said, You don't want sacrifice for the sin. He said, If you desired sacrifice, I could provide it. Yes, the king of Israel. He could have, he could, he, he owned it. As far as it went legal wise, he could have given God anything materially. He, he could have given anything. You remember when he went to the threshing floor of the guy that had it and he said, I want to buy it from you. And the man said, It's yours, David. You don't have to buy it from me. It's yours. You take it. And and King David said, I will not sacrifice or give anything to my God that does not cause me something. Because he had learned, he had learned that God's graciousness and God's goodness is not material things, but it's the things of the Spirit. And he knew that it was in his inward parts. He said, there's nothing I can sacrifice that will pardon this sin. And there's nothing I can do I can give tons of money to your lawyer's family, but that will not get rid of my sin. I, I cannot compensate enough to cover my sins. I can't do enough good to right the wrongs that I have done. Because it's just not, it just can't happen with God. Jesus said that we honor him with our lips, but our hearts are far from him. It's our hearts that he wants. And, and it's not that human heart, but it's that born-again heart that pleases God. And, and we can't do that. Jesus said, what will a man give in exchange for his own soul? And we think that he meant, well, you've got to give this up, and you've got to give that up, and you've got to give that up. Listen, when you repent and you're born again, there will be things that you will let go of. I know that for a fact, but that's not what Jesus meant. Jesus said, what can you give me that will save your soul? What is it you have that you can buy your soul with? Hey, nothing, nothing. There's nothing that we can give for our soul. It is because of his loving kindness and his forgiveness that you and I are forgiven. Not by works are we saved. We can't boast about that. But it is by the mercy of God. In verse 17, he said it is a broken and a contrite spirit. It is a broken spirit. And it is a contrite heart. That word contrite means crushed. It's a heart that has been crushed. 
And, and, that, and that heart being crushed is such a hurt. It is such a pain that takes place. Once that sin was acknowledged before God, that's where the shame comes into play. <laughs> Have you ever been ashamed of what you've done before God? Yeah. Have you ever said something or done something or thought something or read something or listened to something or something that maybe at that moment brought you a little satisfaction or whatever it was, and then a few minutes later, she began to think, wait a minute, wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't have said that or done that or seen this or, well, that's human nature. It happens. We, we were in the mall just here a few weeks ago, probably a month or so ago at Rono. We were going through the mall at Rono. I was on the upper level. I looked down on the lower level and seen the Victoria's Secret store. <laughs> Guys, Victoria has no secrets. <laughs> it was all out there for everybody to see. There was nothing to leave to the imagination. <laughs> and it's the fact that it was there. And you can say, well, you didn't. Yeah, I did. Because it's there. And it's the human part. And I realized that what my eyes saw, his eyes saw. Because he lives in me. And he knows those things. And he knows Victoria and all her secrets that are in her heart. So it's not going to be him. But it's in there. So when you look at King David and you think that King David somehow well, was just a, a you know, just a bad, bad guy. He was a human guy. That's why he said it crushed his heart when he came to the realization that God knew about his sin. And, and it hurt him. Not only did it hurt him the fact that he had sinned, it hurt him that he got caught at it. And that's the biggest thing. That when, when someone is sad that they're busted by the police, it's not necessarily they were busted, it's the fact they got caught. And, and that's what happened to David. At that point, he realized it. And it crushed his heart. And that's why he asked God in verse 10, created me a clean heart. I don't want this crushed, contrite, same old heart. I don't want it to be in here because you know why? If it's in here, then that same old junk is going to be in there. I need a clean yeah. heart. I don't, I don't need the same old heart dusted off and painted and whitewashed. I need a clean heart, David said. And, and he asked God to restore that to him, to, to bring that into him just what he wanted. Listen, one of the most dangerous things that we as Christians have to guard against is spiritual pride. Spiritual pride. A spiritual arrogance. Be, because we, we are saved, we, we do go to church. We do read the Bible. We do pray. To God. And if we think for one minute that that makes us sinless, then we cross the line. Amen. Yeah. If, if we think at that point those are the things that keep us in favor with God, then we have missed the point when God says and Jesus said, hey, it's, it's not the sacrifices I desire, it's the mercy I choose to have upon you. It's the mercy. Yeah, we've got to pray. Yeah, we've got to read our Bibles. Because that's where our nourishment is. That's where our strength comes from. That's what keeps us close to God. You don't have someone in your life that you love that you never speak to, do you? You always want to have that relationship with Him. This is how He speaks to us. And we do that. But if we think for one minute that that is what keeps us from the sin and that it's not possible, then we are in grave danger. Brother James said, be careful when you stand. Be careful when you stand in your own righteousness because that's at the moment that you're getting ready to take a big fall. Brother Richard Kingra spoke to us as new ministers. It used to be when, when a minister was licensed with all the other ministers, they had a meeting, and all the other ministers shared with them what it was like in ministry and, and the issues that they had run into. 
and problems that they had had. And Brother Richard King wrote, when it came his turn to speak, he stood up and he said, I've only got one good piece of advice for you. He said, don't let your head get so big that it goes above the clouds. Because he said, that's where them big jets fly. And he said, when one of them things hits you in the head, you're going to take a big fall. And he said that from experience. And he was speaking about, about pride. He was speaking about the fact that the closer we, we are in Christ and the more that we do, the more work that we do for him, the, the more prayers that we pray to him, the more scripture that we read to him, if we're not careful, we can become as David was. He was the king of Israel. He was the apple of God's eye. He was the one after God's own heart. And God said that after he had said this prayer of repentance. And it was the fact that we looked at that and think, well, we are above it. That's where the problem comes in. And how do we know that? Because David owned up to his humanity. He said, I acknowledge my sin. And he said, I acknowledge my transgressions because in verse 5, I was brought forth into iniquity. And in sin, my mother conceived me. That doesn't mean in the back seat of a 57 Chevy. What that means is she was in sin. She, she was a sinner because all of us are born into it because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And if you think for one minute that you're a select human, that sin has no part of you, then you're making yourself equal with Christ. And I would be afraid to do that. Now, there are ministers that preach today on the TV that we are little gods because we have God in our heart. That makes us little gods. Boy, are they in for a big shot. They're going to get a big surprise if they don't change the way they think. And, and it's the fact that David, he, he told God, he said, in, in, in one sense, he said, but you know my, you know my inward parts, God. You formed me. You created me. Uh, I mean, I came out of the womb. My mother before me was born in sin. Her mother was born in sin. Her mother was born in sin. So it's in us as humans. The identity nature is in there. But listen carefully. That is not an excuse to do it. That is not an excuse to do it. That's why Christ said you must be born again. Because if you're not born again, you're still going to be in that same sin into which you was born into. It's going to cling to you. You can't get rid of it. You didn't bring it into the world, and you certainly can't take it out of your body. Because it's there, you're a human. But you've got to be born again so that he, he can take that sin, and he can put that clean heart within us, and he can renew that spirit. Not a new spirit, but it's a renewed spirit once you get that clean heart inside of us. That's why he says, we're not above sin. Some who would say, well, sin, sin just happens. We'll just ask forgiveness and move on. That, that's a dangerous philosophy for a Christian to have. It's a dangerous philosophy not to be as hurt by sin as God is. And I think that's the biggest thing that, that we have to acknowledge as David did acknowledge. And it may be, we may be able to hide it and no one else may be able to know anything about it. And else we may just see the tip of the iceberg that's above the waterline and we don't deal with those things which have damaged us that, that no one else can see. But they're in there, and it's leaking into our hearts. But we think we've got it good, and we think there's no use for us to, to do anything. Listen, I'm just human. I'll just live with it, and I'll just go on. <clears throat> That's the wrong attitude. Our sin should hurt us as much as it hurts God. Amen. He sent his son to the cross to die for it. Jesus suffered, suffered, and died for sin. Where would we get the idea that it wouldn't bother him? Where would we get the idea that, well, God's just an old man sitting a million miles out there on a great big throne somewhere 
and, and he just looks back at the earth. And when the devil, who accuses us day and night, <clears throat> and the devil would say, look at what he's doing over there. And God would say, ah, boys are just be boys. That's just what they are. Now, I say that about my grandson. I went in the garage this morning and the cat food poured out all over the garage for me. Guess who was in the garage just for eating? And that little two-year-old, he decided the cats need to be fed. Don't worry about the bowl. Just get it out of the bucket and put it in the floor. Well, I can say boys will be boys. But I didn't say, well, I think I'll do that too. I think I'll just throw the bowl away and just throw cat food all over the garage floor. Huh? No. God, God looks at sin from the standpoint that he hates it and it hurts him. That's why Jesus stopped on the Mount of Olives on the way into, into Jerusalem. When, when he went in on Palm Sunday, he stopped and he looked at that city and he wept real tears and he cried and he said, I want to gather you under my wings. I want to forgive your sin. I want to forgive you. I want to save you. But you will not come to me that you might be saved. David realized at that moment that he came into, into contact with Nathan. And when his heart was crushed, he realized how much he had hurt God. And it wasn't necessarily him, but how much God was hurt with his sin. We can make excuses for it. And I have seen those when, when we think, well... A lot of times we just want to be excused and not forgiven. Because if we're forgiven, then we realize we must not do it again. It must not be constant practice. It, it must be something that we acknowledge as sin as David did. And it must be something that we are forgiven for. And it must be something that we let go just as God lets go. We, we, have, we have to put it aside just like he does. And if we kind of carry it around, then we really haven't been forgiven for it. We just want to be excused. And God's not into excuses. He's pleased when our human logic is replaced with his word. That's when he's pleased. Now understand, we're never going to be sinless as long as we dwell in this human body. There is no such thing in humanity as sinless perfection. There was only one human being that had no sin, and that was Jesus Christ himself. And there was no sin found in him. He's the only one that ever was. He's the only one that ever will be. There will never be another one. They had a Christ to act like it's him, but it's not. There will never be another sinless human being because sin is, as David said, conceived within us. But the very fact that it's in us is not an excuse for us to accept it either. We shouldn't accept it either. We, we, are, we are in a day and age, we are in a society where everything bombards us with, with one thing or another, and it's very easy to go with the flow. It's very easy to listen to the reasoning of those who deal in the social sciences. And it's very easy to see from their standpoint where they're coming from with their position. But don't you ever leave this position. Because this is what we are built on. This is what we are founded on. And if it goes against this, it goes against God. Amen. And that's just what he said. And it's not up for our opinion. We don't vote on it. We don't change it. We don't amend it. It is what it is. And that word speaks unto us. And when we sit down and look into it, it's a mirror into our soul. That when this word comes in, it is God that already knows what's in our hearts and sees it. Repentance, true repentance, begins with being truthful with ourselves. You ever lie to yourself? <clears throat> uh, you, ever, you ever told yourself a lie and convinced yourself? Convince yourself about something that, that you knew were true, like, you know, this bald spot ain't really that big. <laughs> I mean, you know, I put a mirror up. You know, I'm like, hey, it ain't really that big. Yeah, it is. It's pretty big. <laughs> but, but you convince, you convince yourselves. And the dangerous part in Christianity is when it 
is when we begin to say, well, I'm all right. Well, I'm okay. Yeah, says who? Says you. It, it, is it your opinion? Or, or have, you, have you talked to the master about it? Have you asked God what he thinks about it? And have you went to Christ and said, purge me as David did? Do a spiritual MRI on this heart, God. See what's below that waterline. We deal with that which is on the surface, like the Victoria pictures in the mall. That's above the waterline. Everybody can see those. But what about that's under the waterline? Where does it go from there? What about that part in the human spirit that only God can see? Do we accept that and say, well, this is this is just part of being human? I mean, this is that's where David realized. He said, You have got to wash me. We cannot wash ourselves. It can't be done. It is only from him. Sister Joyce in Sunday school this morning, I didn't listen. What little time I'm here, you're a great teacher. You're a gifted teacher. So is Sister Iris and Sister Mary. And listen, if you don't do Sunday school, these guys do a great job with it. it, it it's, it's very, very good. Very good. But you made a statement that there was a situation or an incident in which the person had said to her, well, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you were a Christian. Well, that's happened the same with me. If someone, well, I thought you was a Christian. Well, I did too. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I did too. It wasn't the fact that, uh, well, I thought I was too. What is it you see that I don't? Well, that's what David found out when Nathan came to him. He, you know, Nathan could have simply said, you're supposed to be the man after God's own heart. You got that sin in you. But he didn't. He let David come to that conclusion. We, we, listen, we can't condemn people. We criticize them. We criticize them. And we can condemn them, but when I say condemn, it's not saying where they're going to go. I cannot condemn you to hell. I can criticize you, and I can condemn your lifestyle, and I can say this and that and the other, but I have no power, and I have no authority. But this word does. Yes. And this word will convict you. The Holy Spirit doesn't convict, doesn't condemn us. He doesn't come into, into my life and say unto me, well, you're a low down, no good, yellow, liver, whatever, you know, whatever. He doesn't come in and make the condemnation. You don't do this enough. You don't do that enough. You ain't good enough for it. He don't condemn me for who I am, but he brings conviction upon that, which I already know to be true. And he points that out unto me. And he says, this is the part that I don't like. This is the part that I need to purge. When, when David said, sprinkle me with the hyssop, that's how they consecrated the altars. They would dip it in the blood and they would sprinkle <coughs> the altars. They would sprinkle the, <coughs> the utensils that they used as symbolic of God cleansing them and consecrating them or setting them aside. Once in a while, we have to be sprinkled with toxin. Once in a while, we have to have Jesus wash our feet. We're walking in a dirty world. When he washed the feet of the disciples, St. Peter said to him, you'll never wash my feet. <clears throat> and, and Peter meant that with all reverence because Peter loved Jesus. And he wasn't saying it unto him out of out of an arrogant heart, at least he didn't think that he was. And he said, no, no, you're not going to wash my feet, as if to say, I'm the one that should be washing the feet. When John baptized him, John said, I need to be baptized by you. I need the baptism. You need to baptize me. And Jesus said that the scripture might be fulfilled when it happened as it's supposed to happen. So when Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet, I, I imagine, now this is just me, I, I know I think things differently, but I, but I imagine Jesus maybe putting his hands on Peter's knees because he was seated and Jesus was on the floor. And I believe he looked Peter right straight in the eye. And I believe he said, Peter, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Now think about that. He just seen Judas leave the table. 
And he told Judas, he said, go do what you got to do. And he looked Peter in the eye and he says, if I don't wash you, you don't have a part with me. Old Peter got it. Bam. It went straight through his heart. And old Peter said, well, don't just wash my feet. <laughs> Start up here and wash all the way down. Well, ain't that what you would have said? <laughs> yeah, because I want a part with you. And then Jesus said, you're cleansed, Peter. You're already cleansed. But you need your feet washed. we got to go back and have our feet washed sometimes. We have to go back to that point that, that we recognize our humanity. That we recognize that nothing good dwells within us. It, it is that born again heart that Christ gives us that amounts to anything. <coughs> Isaiah the prophet wrote, Our righteousness, which we don't have none, but if we did... He said it's like filthy rags. The cleanest that we can be is still filthy in the eyes of God. We, we can't be good enough to be good enough. And David understood that. And that's something that you and I need to understand. And it is because of his love and kindness. It is because of his mercy. It is because of his willing to forgive. And it is because of our acknowledgement that that's what we need. That's what we need. The moment we step out into our Amen. own power and think that we're living this, I, I tell people all the time, you cannot live a Christian life. I cannot live a Christian life. And they'll cock our eyebrow at you. But we can let Christ live his life through us. Because without him, we can't do it. it it's, not, it's, it's not able to do. Right? Amen. Amen. You think that makes sense? Amen. 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 Father God, I thank you today. I thank you for these who are so tolerant and they're patient. And they are because they love you. It is your word speaking to their hearts that they love. No, it's, it's not about me. I'm, I'm one of them. We're, we're, all, we're all level at the cross. None of us are bigger than any of the rest of us. None of us are worse than any of the rest of us. We're all on the same ground when it comes to that cross. We all, we all have to be thankful for Calvary. And it was because of your sacrifice. And it was because of your blood that was shed. And it's because of your mercy and your loving kindness and your grace and your choosing that we're able to know that today, Lord. So I pray right now that if one who is tuned in or one who will listen later or one who may be in the building today, I just pray that if you've never been born again, if you've never asked Jesus what David did to create in you a clean heart, that he would come into your heart, <coughs> that he would give you that spiritual rebirth. And if you ask him and you want him to, he will do that. He will do that because that's what he longs to do is to save us. He's not out to condemn us as the gentleman from Washington told me. But he does convict us and he is out to save us. And unless we realize that we need to be saved, it's not going to happen. So we must acknowledge that first as we come to him as this warrior king did, as this mighty man of God who at that point in his life was able to be broken. He was able to be crushed. He was able to be brought to a point that he knew that you knew that he needed to be forgiven. And once that happens, once that happens, it pleases you when we ask for that forgiveness and receive it and accept it and allow you to guide us live through us and cause us to be who you want us to be. We'll always be thankful for that. Help us, Lord, not, not to be judges, but help us, Father, help us to be our own judge. As the apostle said, I look within myself. And that's what we have to do as the psalmist just did. We'll give you all the thanks. And we'll give you all the praise because it's by your power by your mind, not by our mind, and by your spirit that does the work. Thank you, Lord. In your wonderful name, we pray, Jesus.
all those who love him will say, we love you, Lord. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. I pray you have a great day. Thank you for being here. Thank you for, for putting up with me. I like the fellow that, that went out went out of church one day and, and he was a new preacher. And, and the guy said he preached and preached and preached and preached and preached. And when they went out, the guy said, young man, has anybody ever told you they could sit and listen to you preach all day? And he said, well, no, no one's told me that. He said, well, where did you get the idea then? 